Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the University Future Festival 2023, to our next keynote. Thank you for joining us. Um, we will talk about Moodle. I don't really have to introduce that to you. Moodle is the platform that is being used by really many, many universities. And this is an open source technology. And uh, yeah, our next keynote will be exactly about that, how an open infrastructure, infrastructure can be uh, founded or used that takes into account all the new technologies that are coming up. And I'm very pleased that he is with us now from uh, remote. Martin Dugamas is with us, the founder of Moodle. Very welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, real pleasure to join you. Uh, I'm in Australia right now, but uh, we can be together this way. Um, I'll, uh, I'll crack right into it. I'm. Uh, um, not only the, the founder and the CEO of Moodle, but also the founder of something called Open EdTech. And I, I want to talk about that today as a little bit as well. And I'm also on the board of Open Education Global, uh, which is a, an organization that is um, uh, bringing together people around open education. So uh, a little bit uh, about me, though. Uh, I come from here. This is the, uh, the center of Australia, pretty much. And it, it looks a bit like this. Um, which, uh, you know, looks a bit like Mars. And I read a lot of science fiction as a child and my whole life, really, and uh, uh, I, I think I've been living a lot of that, and, and, and that informs what I'm about to talk about, which is uh, the, the science fiction. We all find ourselves suddenly becoming science fact. Um, I did all my education uh, on uh, this technology, which was shortwave radio, uh, as a child and uh, so I was doing distance education my whole life and um, it's probably a reason why I started Moodle. Um, so Moodle I'm sure you know and uh, for those who don't though, um, the, the mission of Moodle is to empower educators to improve the world with the most effective platform for learning and that's been going now for over 20 years. We're a very values driven organisation, this is not a Silicon Valley startup. This is an open source project um, and uh, the values are very important. So I like to show them. We value education, we value openness, respect, integrity and innovation. Um, and we are a certified B Corp. Now, uh, the middle of Moodle is 250 people, uh, very globally distributed and in 23 countries and 26 languages. But that's just the core organization that um, manages the project. And we have a lot of partners and a, a lot of uh, collaborators around the world. There's uh, some statistics, some very large numbers you can see uh, of uh, the number of Moodle users, which uh, co covers every country, uh, hundreds of thousands of sites and um, um, very hundreds of millions of users. And these are just registered sites. So most people don't even tell us when they're using Moodle and so they don't appear on these statistics. Uh, interestingly, as we are, I think most of, most of you listening are probably in Germany. Um, Germany is the third largest Moodle country. And so it's a real pleasure to be uh, speaking with you today. Uh, globally, though, Moodle is the, also the mainstream learning management system in higher education, and these are the most recent available stats about that. Um, you can see all the different continents there, and the uh, orange is Moodle, and the other colours are other learning management systems. So, you know, some people have called us the Linux of learning management systems, and I think that's a pretty good um, uh, comparison. Now, the Moodle project is not just the Moodle learning management system. There's a lot of other pieces around that. I won't go into all that today, um, but we have a, a sustainable model of services, and that's what pays those 250 people uh, to be able to work and provide free software. Uh, we also have our own Moodle conference, which happens, uh, a global conference happens annually, and the next one's in Barcelona. Quick plug, if you uh, want to go to Barcelona in uh, September, uh, we're aiming for about a thousand people there, um, and we always have a, a lot of fun at these conferences as uh, people come from about 60 countries. Now, let's, uh, let's look at some global trends. Um, um, 
it's a small planet, right? It's, it's here behind me. And uh, obviously here I am joining you uh, from the other side of the planet at the moment. Um, the, the general trend of humanity has been to uh, both to spread out around the planet and it's only the last 200,000 years that we've been doing so. Uh, and that's not really a long time when you think about it. Um, in 200,000 years, uh, Homo sapiens uh, kind of won the race of the various uh, uh, species of humans and we've, we've encompassed the globe. Um, only 40,000 years in Europe, uh, 50,000 in Australia. Uh, you know, New Zealand only has only had humans for 1,500 years. Um, and what we're doing mostly now, and you'll really feel this, I think, in the last decades especially, is that all these people are connecting we are learning how to connect. We are globalizing again, and we're becoming um, from a, 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 a lot of people that seemed and felt very far apart. Suddenly, the world seems small again as we are connecting, and that's the the bigger trend. So, how are we connecting? We're we're connecting with the internet. A lot of it, you know. Obviously, I could, we could talk for ages about all that, but let's just talk about the internet. So devices, computers uh, uh, look like this. We have phones, um, we have wearables um, that we're actually uh, consuming internet-based content through headphones, uh, through watches. Uh, there's a rise in uh, uh, other wearables like virtual reality and augmented reality. And um, you're seeing a lot of that already, but you, as you may know, next month uh, or in six weeks or so, um, Apple will be announcing their product. And that's a very mainstream uh, company with a very mainstream uh, augmented reality product. And that will really push the, the adoption. And with, with that, what we're seeing and all these devices that we're wearing, that we're wearing and seeing is that the, the internet and the, the content and the um, other people and what they're doing around the world is suddenly coming into our eyes, into our ears, onto our bodies, and we are connecting more tightly than ever before, or at least we have the potential to anyway. And, you know, as we're doing things in the real world, there's going to be more and more of a digital layer of, of educational information that is on top of uh, the things that we're seeing in the real world. And it's not really hard to imagine this. You might think, oh, I'm not going to wear one of those headsets, but a lot of us wear glasses already. And the, we, it's not a big deal, right? You get up in the morning and put your glasses on. It, it, you can see it's not a big stretch that we'll be uh, doing this uh, in the near future. And uh, as the digital worlds and the real world start combining more and more and more, um, and perhaps even going this far, uh, you may have seen um, uh, work being done on direct integration of brains with technology. Um, and that means you could even, you know, what you're thinking can affect the world and uh, the, the world can affect your thinking even more directly than looking through a screen. Um, you know, there's a lot to work out there, but this is what's being developed and this is what is trending right now in the world. On top of that, in that environment, in that space of uh, digital and uh, rea uh, realities and, uh, and uh, the physical realities is the rise, the rise of AI. Um, artificial intelligence has been around since the 1950s. Uh, there were very early attempts back then and over the last decades, uh, I've been following it quite closely and quite disappointed with the, with the progress until very recently. And uh, the, the machine learning of the 80s and 90s was doing things like sorting our mail, um, but it's only the deep learning in the last uh, decade or so that's really taken off. And 11 years ago, uh, we saw uh, the first AI win the game show Jeopardy in the US. Um, which was a milestone. Uh, another milestone was uh, AlphaGo beating the world's best Go player. And this was uh, thought to be one of the hardest games to learn. 
and to understand. And um, this, this AI taught itself how to play by playing against itself. So it's self-emergent learning. Uh, last year, you may remember uh, the uh, protein folding problem was solved. So basically every known protein was solved and there's hundreds of millions of them uh, very quickly, right? In a matter of days. And formally, one of those proteins would be a PhD project or a life's work for a researcher. And, and an AI was able to, to conquer the whole lot, which is huge advancement for science. Uh, now we have AIs, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have been uh, playing with ChatGPT, which was, I think, the, the, the explosion of this stuff into the public awareness. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it can write and understand computer code. It can you know, program things. It can understand and transcribe any speech. It can create and understand all kinds of text. It can create and understand all kinds of images and videos. Um, create and design nearly anything. And if you're following the field, it's accelerated where there are new announcements daily about new uh, progress happening. On top of that, let's look at the progress in robotics. Uh, you've probably seen or heard of the Tesla uh, humanoid robot, uh, which has had a, a lot of press. Um, but obviously, this has been a, a research field for decades. Um, and there are lots of other uh, groups working on uh, very capable robots that um, are proving already very useful and uh, are doing menial jobs in our society. Um, this, they don't have to look like humans, and I think it's better when they don't, actually. Uh, but this one is a Google robot that is connected to one of those AI uh, large language models. And as a result, it's able to plan and execute its own instructions. It doesn't need to be programmed, it programs itself. And you can give it very vague uh, goals and it will work out how to get there on its own. And this is, this is the turning point when, uh, when AI is able to be in the real world and affect the real world, it clearly will be able to affect a lot of things. I'm pretty sure uh, nobody here likes cleaning your kitchen. Um, if, if, if you could get a, a robot that would clean your kitchen and it didn't cost very much, you would probably get one and suddenly you'll have a humanoid robot in your house. Um, and it, it doesn't really seem very far away now. Now, the big fear everyone has is, is about alignment. So if you have AIs on the internet uh, dealing with your taxes and uh, dealing with your education and dealing with your life, um, that's one thing. If those AIs are in the real world walking around, we, you know, we want to make sure they are aligned with what we, what we want uh, as, as human beings. And that's a lot of debate about alignment. But it's important to, to remember that already now, most companies and governments are not aligned with our interests. Um, you know, not everybody votes for every government and not everybody, uh, and most companies are not aligned with our interests. They're aligned with profits. And if they're aligned with profits, they're exploiting us, they're advertising to us, they're trying to manipulate us to do things. And there is very bad alignment with a lot of our key public organizations and what's best for humanity. So that's important to remember. We haven't even sold alignment amongst humans yet, let alone with machines. And there is a real risk that if AI is being developed by corporations and even governments, that uh, the, the war between them um, has a real existential risk for us because they're not aligned. And um, this is the situation we're facing. We're in the middle um, being uh, manipulated for our, you know, as part of the economy, as consumers uh, by advertising based companies or, or marketing based companies and, uh, uh, and governments, which are very often short term thinking in, in government. And, uh, you know, there's not many governments that lay down 50 year plans. Um, at, in most countries, 
and, you know, maybe Germany is better than other countries, but in most countries I know, uh, the thinking is like six months a year, maybe to the next elections. Um, and um, that's not solving our, our problems. So what do we do? By the way, I have a little side thought. What if companies were motivated to, instead of selling us products, where we offered billions in prizes to organizations who solved our greatest problems? And if that was the business model. So there were lots and lots of prizes out there and organizations were chasing those prizes. It's just a thought. Um, if we were to do that, the biggest list of problems that we have in the world that need solving is the sustainable development goals. These 17, and I'm sure you've seen them, um, and there's a lot of uh, detail under this, but these are the ex existential problems that we need to solve and they're to be sustainable on this planet. Um, so as I'm sure a, bit, a lot of you are in education, you, you would realize education is uh, most of the solution. Our education needs to drive healthy behavior in society so that we can all flourish in, in our future world. So how do we best support the spread of this healthy education uh, through technical infrastructure? And when I say healthy, I'm just to reiterate, I'm talking about preventing the risk of us wiping ourselves out. Um, that's healthy. Uh, we are, if we're just teaching people how to do marketing to, you know, boost profits and uh, achieve exponential growth uh, in selling stuff to people, um, we, we are not actually uh, solving the real problems. We're actually doubling down on causing the problems that have got us here in the first place. So I'll spend the rest of my time talking about uh, my vision for uh, an infrastructure that will support this kind of uh, education and, um, and I call it open ed tech, open education technology. Now this is an association, uh, I've been starting an association, it's based in Brussels. Um, we are 99% done with that registration. We're at the final stage where the, uh, I think the King of Belgium has to um, put a stamp on it. Um, but this actually is a movement that started uh, back in 2019 and we had our first conference in Barcelona and uh, we've been discussing these topics ever since. So the overall map for those who like to chunk down the information um, is a bit like this. So there is a notion of a cloud, um, a cloud hosting infrastructure, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, and that supports three main things. One, it supports quality open content. Key, the, very, the key is on quality because there is a lot of content, but quality open content. Um, it supports educator spaces. It supports learning spaces, learner spaces, and also uh, in the picture are organization spaces. And these are all linked with standards and they're all supported by AI. So let me go into this into some, uh, a little bit of detail. So the first part on the cloud hosting, what do I mean? Now, we obviously have lots of cloud hosting. You can go to Amazon, you can go to lots of companies and start a server and put your stuff there. The, what the ideal hosting, however, is uh, prevents a lot of the risks that we have with this current kind of cloud hosting. So the perfect cloud hosting is open, open infrastructure, which means it's all globally compatible, but locally adaptable. So when we build things, we, we think of it that way. It needs to be compatible, but also adaptable because what, institutions want to do in Germany is not the same as what they want to do in uh, Australia or Senegal or the US or etc. Uh, now there are lots of cases of this kind of thinking. You look at email, the, the most successful message, messaging platform in the world, um, despite everything that's come since, we all have an email address and in fact most of the internet to get onto a site, you need to use your email address. So it is a foundational layer of the internet. Guess who owns email? Nobody. 
It's an agreed standard and open infrastructure standard that we all use. Uh, HTTP, EduRoam, you may be familiar with, uh, BitTorrent or Matrix, Blockchain. These are examples of distributed federated systems that operate uh, and allow a lot of data and processes to happen without anybody owning it, without any central control and, without it, uh, and removes a lot of risks of a company dying, a server uh, a, a hosting company disappearing, and all of those risks don't exist because the risk is spread over many thousands of, of places. Number two, it's very important that this stuff is free for life. If we want to support learners for their whole lifetime, they can't be paying $9.95 a month to somebody. They, they can't even be using it for free and having an organization paying $9.95 a month for it because uh, those will all stop. Those are all at risk. Um, we need something that is free and forever and things need to be designed free and forever. So third, just look at all the risks. You know, it has to be safe from funding changes. Nobody can say, oh, you know, we haven't got money for that anymore. Uh, uh, it has to be safe from oppression. We can't have governments saying, I'm sorry, these things aren't allowed anymore, or even a company saying these things are not allowed anymore um, when it comes to education. Um, uh, it has to be safe from corporate takeover uh, or pollution. So we've seen the case many times uh, where uh, public goods like say Twitter, uh, you know, uh, get a new owner and new rules and things change and the public domain is affected by the actions of even a single individual or, uh, you know, a company that has a different motive. Um, and this idea of destroying the commons uh, is a common one. So, you know, when you, even when you have something that's shared and common, you have to be careful that companies or can't come in and start controlling it. Um, as happens in email with people who run spam lists, they start gaining a level of control over the system that is uh, a bit much sometimes. They are able to block your domain from working. And if, that's, if they do that by accident, it's very hard to get it fixed. So, my proposal is that we build a cloud infrastructure as higher education. Now, there are 90,000 higher education institutions in the world. Um, a lot of them are public. More of them are private, actually. This is the, st the stats of that. But that's a, a lot of institutions. Imagine if every institution there, um, imagine if only half the institutions donated one server to a cloud. So now you have 45,000 servers. And if they were operating together, you could have a, a, a tremendous infrastructure. It would be bigger than Amazon. Um, so maybe not bigger than Amazon, but it's certainly big enough for what we need. So this is about how we work together as an education community to, uh, to build this infrastructure to support the other things I'm going to talk about. And this to me is part of the philosophy that universities should not just be consumers of what companies produce. Universities should model the better world. Universities should be where innovations and research, I mean, it's where research happens, right? It's where that research and innovations should be flowing out of and actually running a lot of levels of society, particularly education. It's like, it makes so much sense to me. I don't see why a university should be sitting back and picking a product off the shelf to, to do its core business. Okay, the second part is quality open content. And um, you've heard of open education resources. There are many, many uh, projects doing that, but the level of quality varies and the level of risk in those also varies because a lot of that stuff uh, is sitting on somebody's server and in five years, nobody wants to pay for that server anymore and it's gone. So that needs to sit on a cloud. Um, and something we're, we're doing at Moodle is Moodle Net. Uh, and uh, I've taken over this project recently, personally again, and we're spending the rest of the year just focusing on qu the quality problem. Um, and uh, if you're interested, you can contact me about that. But uh, 
some of that will be how do we make sure that content that addresses SDGs is uh, raised up and how can we get more of that into our, uh, our teaching, our curriculums. Uh, the third component here is the learner space. We are all learners. And uh, when you're a learner, what we need, I think, is something that supports our learner journey. So we make a lot of decisions. We have a lot of roads to choose at every stage of our life. And to make those decisions and to make those decisions happen, uh, we need support. Now we have mentors and parents and friends who help us, but they're not connected with all the possibilities that are around us. And I think there's a big opportunity here to build a system that lives on that cloud that you have for life, that has an AI in it, that finds you those educational opportunities and takes you towards your goals. So, you know, you wanna be an engineer, so, okay, here are the, the courses you can take, at, here are the universities, here are the local, uh, there's someone around the corner who can help you, there's someone over across the world who can help you, um, all of those things. And I haven't got time to go through this slide, but if you're looking at this online, you can pause it. Uh, but I, this is my model of what I think lifelong learning looks like. It's about 50% formal. And the idea of that is to give you the feel of being a professional in a particular area. And then there's 50% informal, which is where you curate your own feeds. And this is the ongoing learning in that field. Um, and mostly what you're doing is finding experts to follow or gurus out there. Um, so I think the first one, the formal one, should be more human led to help you become a professional in a field. And the second one is more AI led because it's very personal and you need an AI that can uh, guide you. The next piece uh, component is the uh, educator space. And uh, I won't go too much into that, but think of Moodle, but floating in the cloud and particularly think of it as being owned by the educator. So I think educators should own their own classrooms. I think they can still work at organizations, but they would bring their classroom with them into the organization. All of their resources, all of their tools and their skills that they bring with them are in this product that they bring with them. So they need to own it. Um, and it becomes an extension of themselves. It allows them to handle thousands of students or millions of students if you want to, uh, and produce different instances of teaching for different uh, audiences and so on. Um, so that's, that's an important part. And the last bit here is on artificial intelligence. And uh, there are lots of qualities of an ideal artificial intelligence and uh, it should be trusted. It needs to be trusted. We cannot exist on a company like OpenAI to run uh, AI. And already there are open source AIs everywhere and that's good to see. Uh, you can run it on your own hardware, you can control it, you can understand it. Um, lots of things that we can do there. A, a second really key point is interpretability. If, if an AI gives you something, you should be able to ask it, can you fully explain how you got there? Where did these facts come from? And secondly, what are your logical process, your deductions to get there? I think that should that is something governments should mandate, that AIs that are around should be able to do those two things because if you don't, if you do that, you actually slow down AI development enough so we can start to adapt and you're actually able to find out what it's doing. And lastly, it needs to be friendly to us, which means educating AI like we would educate our own children to be part of and be a good element in society. Uh, one little project we have at Open EdTech already, we're playing with something called EduBot. If you're interested with the EduBot, uh, look, for, look for that on the Open EdTech site. Um, but this is a, a very interesting thing that we're doing here that uh, you can have any AI as a back end and it connects into any chat group um, and it becomes a member of a chat group and it facilitates educational discussions. Um, so if you're interested, go follow that up. Any of this, look at openedtech.global. 
that's the website uh, and you'll find out more stuff there and you can join our chat groups and so on. So just lastly, uh, it's important to remember, you know, we are all living together on this little planet and uh, I think it's time uh, that we started thinking like a species uh, and, and what is the infrastructure we all need together rather than lots of little projects or capitalism fighting each other, we need to be planning some infrastructure. And uh, if you're interested in uh, talking about any more of this with me uh, or uh, the Open Ed Tech group, please reach out. Here's all the contact details and uh, I'd be very happy to hear from you. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, thank you for sharing your vision. It's so good to listen to you. You're so passionate about your topic. Uh, so now we don't have that much time left for some questions, but yeah, let's do a quick round. Uh, we have some questions that came up. Uh, what are the quality criteria for choosing open content? A question from Orkan Jalo. Um, Jal Jalilov, sorry. So that varies, it's very uh, relative, but um, a, key, a key one is finding truth. So there is a search for truth as we are always doing in uh, say the research uh, paradigm, uh, the peer review uh, mechanisms and so on. Um, basically, uh, if a lot of people say something is high quality, then it is high quality. And that will be contextual. Uh, and we believe that there's a method there using a gamification approach, a bit like Stack Overflow, um, combined with AI to do a lot of the work, uh, the, the, the hard work of summarizing and, uh, and checking. And the, the more opinions you have, then the more you can say it's high quality. Well, thank you. Uh, great initiative, Open Ed Tech. Which members do you have from Germany so far? This is one question. And uh, also somebody wants to know which uh, members in Denmark. Can you share this with us? Well, the association hasn't formally started yet. It will be in a couple of months uh, and then we'll have formal members. So uh, right now we have a lot of interested people and I can't name them all here. I probably shouldn't name them here, but if you come to Open EdTech and join our chat groups, you'll see everybody in the chats uh, and you can find that out. Great. But we are really hoping to see more organisations, especially more higher ed organisations, uh, consider joining as, as members to the association and helping us push these things forward. And back to Moodle for one question. Is it planned that AI tools and features are being implemented in Moodle? So I'm, uh, I'm just about to release a survey to the Moodle community to ask uh, what they think we should do because there are a lot of ideas and there's uh, pros and cons of both. Uh, you know, a simple one would be whenever you're typing content, allow it to be AI generated. Of course, that comes with uh, problems as well. So we, we have um, the survey. Please look, look for it on the site probably the next few days, actually, on Moodle.org and, uh, and, and give us your opinion because we really want to hear what, the, what you think. We'll do that. Thank you so much, really. We enjoyed listening to you, Martin Dugyamas. Thank you for being with us from Thank Australia. You. And have a nice evening. I guess it's about dinner time in Australia now, right? Oh, it is about that. Yes, I can see the kangaroos just coming out in the bush out the window. <laughs> so it must be. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. All have right. a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a good day. Thank you.